This is the island of Maui. We're here because this place has been at the center of a fierce debate about whether we should grow and eat genetically modified food. And that question is only getting more important. At the current rate, we will have to grow more food in the next 30 years than we have in all of human history. Doing that without destroying the environment that we live in will be one of the defining challenges of our generation. And many experts argue that to do that, we'll have to engineer the genes of our food. But the safety of that technology has been controversial for decades. So should we be worried about genetically modified food? Chocolate peanut butter. Chocolate peanut butter. <laughs> oh my god. How is it? Really I can't good. tell if that was good or bad. It's Reese's peanut butter for breakfast. In a Cheerio. I love it. Why are we here? <laughs> <laughs> we are here in my we home. Are here in I have my brought home. you here. <laughs> I brought you guys here to talk about GMOs. I'm curious to hear how you grew up thinking about them. Because for me, I was I was definitely taught that. GMOs are a terrible thing. In my family, it was just never something that was talked about ever. I always thought that the big business around GMOs is something to be like hated. All these labels starting appearing, like this one, non-GMO project verified, which seems to signal to people that there's something harmful about GMOs. There's one thing at this table that does contain genetically modified organisms and is labeled as such. And I'm curious if y'all can huh. find it. It's not the coffee. This one says non-GMO. It's the one that y'all haven't looked at yet. <laughs> <laughs> the fruits. Mm -mm. No. Partially produced with genetic engineering. Oh, it is the it Cheerios. Is. It's at the very this bottom of the box. sneaky little. If you look through the ingredients, you can see whole grain oats, sugar, peanut butter, dextrose, cornstarch, and corn syrup. And corn was probably produced with genetic engineering. In a way, it's almost like a status symbol for your foods if you're able to identify that all your foods have the positive label of being GMO free. I guess my question to you, Chris Evan, mm. is it a good label? Like, is that something that I should be looking for? Um. To understand how we got here, we have to talk about the first GMO. This is the Flavor Saver Tomato leading up to its launch. People call this the super tomato. It became major news. The future is now, at least in terms of the American diet. Genetically altered tomatoes are a step closer to your supermarket tonight. The new tomatoes will soon be on a store shelf near you. When it hit shelves, it became the first commercial crop that was genetically modified. It was designed to be less perishable than regular tomatoes. What followed was a new generation of bioengineering initiatives that promised to feed the world, including things like golden rice, a GMO enriched with beta carotene to combat blindness and death from vitamin A deficiency. Researchers believe they have found a way to add critical nutrients to rice. Vitamin A deficiency is a pervasive and silent killer of malnourished children in the third world. But over the next few years, public perception of GMOs went from gentle curiosity like this. As long as it was, it was healthy, you know, no, no health risks, yeah, I'd consider it. To bitter divisiveness like this. Hell no, GMO! Hell no, GMO! Other scientists, labs tried to scientists. replicate that study and found that it wasn't no, true. No, actually, that is not true. Yes. There's no question of your opinion. One side says that modifying food is totally harmless, and the other side says that it's a serious threat to us. They take viruses and bacteria and insecticides and put them into the DNA. More often than not, they're inserting viruses or bacteria into these plants. But that's not exactly how it works. So let's clear things up. Cleo, you here right now? Sure. All right. 
So genetic engineering works by taking a tiny piece of DNA from one organism and putting it inside of another organism. That tiny piece of DNA is called a gene. It is a set of instructions that tells the organism how to express a trait. You can kind of think of that like taking a recipe from one cookbook and putting it inside of another one. So one set of instructions here contain a really special trait, and it's bookmarked. Insect killer. Exactly. Grandma's insect killer recipe. <laughs> this one page tells that bacteria how to create this protein that kills insects. OK, so how does this gene get from the bacteria to the corn? You can use kind of this bacterium that naturally goes into the other plant and like dumps the DNA off. Or you can use something called a gene gun. The gene gun literally shoots gold particles that are covered in DNA <laughs> into cells of the corn. This corn plant will then produce those same insecticide proteins. And what that means is that farmers now would not have to spray those corn plants with insecticide. So it's not as though GMOs are using a small part of a bacteria and putting it into corn or something else. It's more like they're taking a small instruction that a bacteria has and allowing corn to also have that instruction. Is that right? Exactly. So what do we know about how safe it is to eat something like this? Mm, let me show you. In the past 20 years that we've been eating these crops, there have been no negative health impacts on consumers. That's great. Yeah. I learned all of this from Pamela Ronald. She is a geneticist at UC Davis. We've been genetically engineering many different types of plants and genetically injuring medicines for over 40 years. And there hasn't been a single instance of harm to human health or the environment. We know that from thousands of studies, but they're probably best summarized in this one from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. So this is like a meta study of thousands of reports. Can I get a highlighter? Great. There's some evidence that GE Insect-resistant crops have had benefits to human health by reducing insecticide poisoning. The research, blah, 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 of GE foods reveals no differences that would implicate a higher risk to human health from eating GE foods mm -hmm. than from eating their non-GE counterparts. Mm -hmm. That's the money That's line. That's it. This seems so certain, but it, it also seems like this is such a big controversy. It is. So this 2015 Pew Research poll found the majority of Americans believe that it's not safe to eat genetically modified food, but almost 90% of scientists say that they're safe. And this gap is the biggest of any politicized scientific issue. So that means bigger than climate change, bigger than vaccines. It makes me feel like there must be some other issue mm -hmm. with GMO products or GMO companies that people are really struggling with. Mm -hmm. That's like what I want to figure out. Yeah. So the thing is, as much as people might worry about GMO fruits and vegetables, you're not really likely to find them in produce. They're in cheap processed foods made from GMO corn and soy. And the vast majority of GMO crops don't actually even wind up in food. You know, for the most part, they are turned into biofuels or into feed. In the US, where over 90% of corn is genetically modified, just 10% is turned into things that people actually consume. So all that genetic engineering allowed us to do was to grow crops like that on a bigger scale than ever before. Could it have more to do with how the business of GMOs is actually implemented? There's one place that I think can help us answer that question, and it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Hawaii is ground zero for developing new genetically engineered crops. In the 1990s, the entire papaya industry in Hawaii was basically on the verge of collapse. Plants started to be infected by papaya ring spot virus. This problem persisted for decades, and then came something called the rainbow papaya. This was a transgenic variety that was designed to resist the virus. Until 2017, this was the only GMO's fruit that was sold in the US. This fruit was proof that genetic engineering could really benefit both consumers and farmers. But it also kicked off a long debate about what genetic engineering means for the state of Hawaii. 
It's hosted more open air experimental field tests than any other state in the country, and the U.S. grows more GMOs than any other country in the world. And all of these companies are here because Hawaii's tropical climate allows for three to four plantings of seeds per year, as opposed to just one on most parts of the mainland U.S. It kind of creates this like ultimate outside laboratory for seed companies. We're gonna go visit one of these test fields that's owned by Bayer with members of the Shaka movement. So tell me what Shaka is. The Shaka movement is the sustainable Hawaiian agriculture for the keiki and the aina. Okay, we're here in Kihei, and these are the Hale Pialani homes, and they are next to the Monsanto test field here in Kihei. Now, these people are right on top of the problem. What they're doing in the test field is they're trying to see how much herbicide the plant, the seed can take. We know test, the, the pesticide drifts, especially with this wind, and it would bring it right into these homes, straight into these homes. This was one of the reasons for the moratorium, was the proximity of these test fields to these homes we're standing next to. In 2014, Maui County passed a moratorium on the research and development and production of GMOs. Hawaii is the center of a fight between the companies who make crop seeds here and residents who say they are being poisoned. Hawaii's Maui County passed one of the strongest anti-GMO measures ever. The battle over the Maui County GMO moratorium is headed to court. Eventually that moratorium was overruled in a federal court. We were just asking to we slow down, take a breath, stop, and let's see what's going on in terms of experimentation with these open fields putting all these people in danger, right? It was easy for the industry to turn around and go, oh, you're anti-GMO. You know, are you anti-science when you're being openly tested on? And the fact that they're going, we're experimenting with this corn, we're gonna see how much pesticide it can handle before it dies. Look where you're doing it. You're doing it where people live. Okay, let me clarify what they're talking about. One of the most popular kinds of genetically engineered traits is something called herbicide tolerance. By giving a plant a gene that makes it resistant to one specific kind of chemical, farmers can spray herbicide on their plants to kill weeds without having to worry about harming their crops. So even though the other most common kind of genetically engineered trait successfully reduced the need for insecticide, this particular GMO trait actually encourages the use of more herbicides. Since 1996, when the biotech company Monsanto first introduced crops, tolerant to glyphosate, that's the active ingredient in the herbicide Roundup, the use of that chemical has skyrocketed. Now, glyphosate has traditionally been considered a relatively safe herbicide, but in 2015, the World Health Organization concluded that it likely causes cancer to humans who are exposed to it. Now, there are thousands of lawsuits against Bayer, which acquired Monsanto, for failing to warn consumers of those risks. We reached out to Bayer for comment, but at this time, they haven't provided a statement. I can count three chickens from where I stand, <laughs> but there are more everywhere. Whoa. My name is Lauren Pang. I was born and raised in Hawaii. I got involved in this issue of GM growing. Walk me through what the concerns that people here have about those okay. kinds of crops in particular. The Maui community was quite upset about corporate agriculture in Hawaii and on Maui. Our concern are the pesticides, okay? You're using too many pesticides. But when the stuff you put is blowing on the wind and you haven't told anybody downwind who got drifted about informed consent and they never got to respond, that's unethical. This is the framework of human experimentation. I will give them the benefit of the doubt that they want to feed the world and use less pesticides. I will give them that. That does seem to be something that we hear a lot on this topic is this what, idea that GMOs are a necessary technology to feed the world. Corporations and scientists have shown us the goals. Where you want, feed the world. I'll give that to you, maybe we're trying to feed the world. But the process that we get there seems to trample on certain people's rights. We're about to go talk to Dr. Harold Kaiser. He's going to explain to us what genetically engineered crops look like here in Hawaii. And we're climbing up a hill. That's Harold. He found a chameleon. 
because they have a very long tongue. <gasps> oh my God, oh my God. Oh. It's on the camera. <laughs> It's so hard to separate the technology from its context of big ag. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that is going to make this argument endure <laughs> for a long time? Like, when are we going to stop talking about this? Genetic engineering is safe as any other form of plant breeding. Regulation is so expensive. You know, to get it through all the stages at EPA and Food and Drug Administration, to get a new product out. And I mean, I think that's also part of why the focus has been on the major crops, because they spend all this money and then that's where they're gonna, you know, they're gonna go after the big payoffs first. Corn, soybean, uh, alfalfa, cotton, things that are on, you know, big acreages. You know, there's been consolidation. And that basically crowds out everyone except for oh, yeah. the and large somebody ones and with incentivizes. Really deep with deep pockets. So how did these companies become so powerful? Well, at the same time that GMO technology was taking off, the seed industry was also undergoing major changes. Let me show you how. Each of these seeds represents an individual seed company back in 1996. By 2018, all of these were fully or partially owned by Monsanto, which made it the biggest seed company in the world. The pharmaceutical company Bayer bought Monsanto for $63 billion. But it's not just Bayer. Dow and DuPont merged to become Corteva, and ChemChina acquired Syngenta. Today, these four companies control over 60% of the world's seed sales. Those companies patent the genetics of their seeds, which means that farmers can't harvest their own seeds. They have to buy them every year. And because these seeds work hand in hand with the chemicals produced by the same companies, you can't really have one without the other. So for some, adopting GMOs means buying into a system where for the first time in the history of agriculture, farmers are not fully controlling and owning their seeds. But even though there's immense pressure to do so, not every farmer is buying into that system. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> how's it going? All right, how you nice to see you. This is like, in, a, in full operation. We just put this extension and you can see this is where the door used to be. We took that shade house down, poured the slab, and then did all this. The system comes on. And you hear that sound? Uh-huh. That's the sound of money. <laughs> we produce about five to 600 pounds of greens a week. And uh, we do it on a 2,500 square feet on a 9,000 square foot lot. So you could say I'm probably one of the largest, smallest farmers here in Hawaii. This conversation about genetic engineering in, in food has gotten so much attention as kind of a focal point for how this conversation is happening all across yeah, the world. Yeah, because of the corporate takeover of agriculture, so to speak, has been consolidation. I mean, it's happening today, um, has been a big issue. The farmers are going back to these companies going, hey, man, we got bugs attacking our plants, you know, well, here and they start giving them petrochemical pesticides and herbicides, and it didn't take long before that just spiraled out of control. Farmers were trying to find ways to make ends meet. That created, that, that whole attack on the plant created a dysfunction, and that's when genetic engineering came in. So I feel it was a dysfunction on top of a dysfunction, which creates dysfunction squared. Am I against GMO? Um, I just don't support it. You know, as a farmer, I want to grow food for people without using that kind of uh, technology. And, um, and so that's my main interest. Little did I realize that I could actually make a living on a postage stamp with agriculture. This is where we grow what I call the chocolate cake. Yeah, you can take straight it. Through. This is like black gold. We're here in paradise on earth. We can grow a lot of food. Here I am on Maui. I mean, we're gonna be Here we are. gonna ask. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. The idea of genetically modified food is so often sold to us based off of future promises. Crops that can resist a changing climate or with better yield or with improved nutrients to feed the world. More efficient water use, bigger root systems, nutrient uptake, there's definitely potential. But GMOs today don't live up to that potential. Right now, most aren't even turned into food. The real reason to worry about GMOs isn't that they're unsafe to eat. It's how they're being used today. 
It's the pesticides and the herbicides we worry about. This is no way farming to feed people. And right now, the agricultural practices that some GMOs encourage have demonized a technology that objectively could help a lot of people. That's part of why in 2013, anti-GMO activists in the Philippines destroyed a test field for golden rice, setting public sector research back by months. It's collapsing under its own weight. That technology is not producing the promise that it said it's going to feed the world and all that stuff. The biggest tragedy of all would be if the GMOs that could help people the most fail because of concerns that don't have anything to do with the technology itself. That's what we should be worried about when we worry about GMOs. Thank you so much for watching. For more episodes of Glad You Asked, you can click the link to the right. And for more amazing learning content on YouTube, go ahead and click the link on the bottom right. Thanks again.